Welcome to Joy of Business with host Simone Melissis, a dynamic business leader with a difference. Simone has founded and operated many businesses from a young age and has always done business differently. Today, Simone is the worldwide coordinator of Access Consciousness and travels the world presenting Joy of Business programs using access tools and empowering people to know that they can create business in a different way and make money doing it. Simone Millis' Weekly on Ohm Times Radio. Hey everybody, this is Simone Millis' on Joy of Business Radio Show at Ohm Times. And I am at home at the moment, Pridgian Beach, Sunshine Coast, heading off to the U.S. tomorrow. We've got some interesting guests today. I've never actually met them, but this is Johnny B. Truant and Sean Platt. So welcome, Johnny and Sean. Hey, Hi, great Simone. to be here. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm Johnny. <laughs> I'm Sean. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and we've also got Emily Russell on here, who Emily is our social media expert and the Joy of Business team. So welcome to you also, Emily. Hi. So today the show is called Self-Publishing, What on Earth Makes It Easy and Fun. Now, I've been watching some of your uh, YouTube, well, your Google Hangout actually, uh, show Sean and Johnny, and it's like I would say that you guys actually make it fun would be what I would say. <laughs> and it's like you guys have done a lot of different things here, and it's like I even checked out, Johnny, your, uh, your I think it's you that wrote the book, The, the Fat Vampire. The whole that was section me, of yeah. them, yeah. <laughs> so you've written a whole lot of books. So let's start with, and it's like, because what I'd love is for people listening to this show is actually to, I mean, we can send them to what, what you guys have got available as well, and also to sort of empower them and encourage them to see what would it be like to self-publish a book. Because I see that people have so many ideas of what they'd like to get out there into the world, and yet that's the sort of crunch. It's like, yes, I can write something, but then what happens? I've got to find a publisher or you know, is self-publishing easy? So first of all, if you guys can start, either any one of you, is uh, what actually got you guys into this with the self-publishing? The um, whole idea. I, 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 just the fact that we can. I, I would definitely agree that it's fun. I wouldn't say that it's easy. Um, I think that it's, you know, it's certainly easier. As, the than, process you know, is easy. Making a living at it is not easy. Right. You, you don't have to stand in line. You don't have to ask permission. You don't have to fill out all the query letters. Um, that kind of stuff would have, you know, it, it certainly held me back. You know, I think it, it held Johnny back. Um, it, which, it, we weren't really interested in that. We we would rather, you know, bet on ourselves and go forward and do it and believe that we could build an audience. Um, but, the, you know, the actual mechanics of loading your book into the um, dashboard uh, on Amazon or any other bookseller after you, you know, have a compile and a cover and a, and a clean edit, that's all relatively basic and straightforward. But building the audience and, um, you know, getting enough books to actually matter and, and, you know, have dedicated readers, none of that is easy. That takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of strategy. Um, but it is fun. And I think that certainly the way we approach business um, is, is fun. And we are always trying to, um, you know, be excited about the things that we're working on. And, and Sean and Which I are I, also – oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was going to say what Sean and I have in common is we're both sort of um, incurable entrepreneurs, say. And so <laughs> the idea of asking for permission is um, very strange to us. So uh, the thing about self-publishing is modern, you know, indie self-publishing is that you you do make all the rules. And people say that there are no gatekeepers anymore, and that's it's it's true in a way that people kind of mean it, like the spirit of it. But it's also very much not true because your readers are ultimately the gatekeepers. But the reason that we enjoy it so much is because the readers are the gatekeepers rather than say, than some arbitrary person who's, you know, managing a slush pile at a publishing house and deciding whether or not you even, like your work even gets in front of the literary agent, which is a route that I tried for a long time um, before any of this happened. And it's it's gratifying that our success or failure is in our hands rather than somebody else's arbitrary hands. So, Johnny, you actually started writing books first. Is that like your – and then did you try and go to publishers or first off? Yes. I wrote my first book beginning in 1999, I think, and it's 2015 as we record this, so it's been a while. And <laughs> I finished the whole draft, and I did um, – I don't know if anybody out there can relate to this. It's sort of an eye-rolling, like wiping the sweat off your brow sort of experience. Like, oh, yes, I remember that. 
I went and I, I got the writer's market, the big fat book, and I went through and I looked at literary agents and I went to liter, um, like writing conferences and met agents there. And I did the whole thing where I just submitted query letters and one or two of them said, you know, give me three chapters before I reject you. And I just collected rejection slips after rejection slips. And so I did all of that. And then, you know, 12 years later, I already kind of knew Sean, but I did an interview with him for my blog, which had nothing to do with self-publishing. I was doing other stuff. And I kind of, he and his other partner, David Wright, were already doing this and already making a career out of it. And that's when it dawned on me, like, oh, I don't, I don't need to do that anymore. I can do it the way that Sean and Dave are doing it. Nice. I like that. So it's like, it's a little bit like, um, I had these friends in Australia, uh, that are musicians, same sort of thing. And one of them totally started their music industry at the same time. One decided to sign with Sony, became number one in Australia, like pretty much immediately. And the other one is still, uh, you know, looking after himself and running his own business. And it's interesting to see because one of them didn't really want to, he explained he didn't want to sell himself out to, you know, Sony and be controlled by Sony, et cetera. And, and the other guy was, is, he's still doing the pub run so it's sort of like but he owns everything and he makes way more money per album he sells and he's got a huge following that he's created but that's one thing that i do get and which you guys have actually mentioned as well it's like building the audience and it's like so what are some of the first steps of how people actually do start to build the audience it's like you write a book i mean let's let's use your fat empire um, fat empire fat vampire uh, range johnny and it's like so how do you build the audience for people to come along and actually, you know, find those people who are interested in that? Well, to to set um, to set the ground here, um, you you mentioned Fat Vampire. That was my first like self published series. Like that was that's kind of my thing. Um, but Sean and I actually write most things together. So okay, and that was that was that came after that. So we have we produce about 1.5 million words a year. So that's like the Harry Potter series, the whole thing and a half. Every year is sort of what we produce. Wow. So um, the answer is the same across just about anything that we, we do, though, and that's um, – well, I'm, not, I'm not even sure how I want to answer this today, Sean. Do you want to take a stab at it? Because I could take you through the complicated way that we do it, but maybe this is more for somebody who's just starting out. Um, yeah, what, what, what's the question? Just how do you, how do you get started? How well, do you... actually, do you know what? It's actually a, it's actually a pretty it is a pretty big question. I get that that I just asked you for your whole thing. So it's like let's also right now. How do you do it? Like, yeah, do? it's like tell us exactly how you do. It. Yeah. So we can because I know you guys have got a whole thing available. It's even on Udemy and everything. So it's like where do people find your? Because you what did you do? You wrote um you wrote a book. Well, I, I, I think on I have a, a good idea where to start this. It, it's okay. it's the idea is um you know a, a lot of writers think of um finishing their book and getting it out there. And now I'm a published author and they really think of that as the finish line. And for us, it's just, okay, we got that. Oh, what's next? And I think that there's um, a, a real beauty to what we do where it's, we're always momentum. We're always finishing a project, um, you know, starting another project and there's not a lot of, of rest. Recently, um, last week, Johnny came down to Austin and, um, we were together for a week and, um, you know, mapping out our, our new project and, you know, what we want for the next six months or so. And um, we get together as often as we can to do that. Um, and, and the day he <laughs> he left to come to Austin, he had just finished one project and then he started the next project the day he got back. And there's really no um, – if he hadn't come to Austin in that time, it would have been just one day to the next. Okay, now I'm starting the next thing on the next day. And we always have something kind of percolating. And with Dave and I, um, you know, a few years ago, we had finished one book, and we were trying to figure out the best way to market that book. And we ultimately decided that the very best thing we could do is to write another book. And the way that we build our audience is by just always giving them – new material because there are a lot of ways to market yourself you know you can run facebook ads and you know do blog tours and there, there are, there's just a ton of ways to be out there you could spend all your time on twitter and facebook um you know do a podcast or whatever it is um which but, is i think how we found you right but <laughs> ultimately i really believe that the very best marketing that you could possibly do for your work is to just create more of it so then let me ask you this, because it's like, do you write based on what you guys would like to write about, or do you also base write based on what your audience is asking you for? 
that's a great question that I am eager to answer <laughs> because it's a, <laughs> it, it, it's well because I would say it's a mix of the two, but it's also this weird hybrid third thing where um, what we want is what our audience wants. So right now I'm what what I just finished was the fourth book in our our alien invasion series. It, it, the first book was invasion, and then there was contact colonization, and I just wrote annihilation. That was the project that Sean mentioned that I was finishing up right before I went to Austin. And that's mm-hmm. our most commercially successful series. That's the one that um, most of the people on our mailing list are there because of that. It's the one that has sold the most copies. It's the one that has the most people sniffing around about other rights that are available. And it's the one we're asked the most about. And right now, uh, no, actually in, in about a week and a half, I'm going to start the exact opposite of that. I'm going to start our least commercial property. Um, we, we currently have a book called Axis of Aaron. It's a standalone. It's a literary mind bender, so it's not a series. It, it totally stands alone, stands alone. And Invasion sells more in a couple hours than that book sells all month. It's just, that's just how it is. Mm-hmm. But the, the book that I'm going to start next is our year, this year's Axis. It's a book called Devil May Care, and it's literary, and we're taking a disproportionately large amount of time to write on it, and we expect it to sell about as well as Axis. Like, it'll sell a couple copies a month if we're lucky. But the reason we do that is because we, I'm just so excited to write it. Like, that, that's, th- those are our passion projects. So right. on one hand, we're sort of mixing the highly commercial stuff that people are asking for with, with our, like our true passion projects, meaning that we're passionate about all of it, but we wouldn't do those if we weren't passionate because there's no money there. And then, right. um, but what, what happens is, like, it's hard to be asked enough for when's book four in the Invasion series. I'm really excited without being excited to write the commercial project, if that makes any sense. So it all works out really yeah. well for us. Cool. So you do some jo- some jobs that are love jobs, <laughs> more so, and some that are actually money spinners for you as well, which are fun too. Yeah, probably. we're always willing to sell out, but we're only willing to sell out for stuff that excites us anyway. And yeah. it's all it's all fun. Like there's nothing we've never written anything that we don't love from any because we hop around genres. Like we've written westerns and horror and fantasy and young adult and nonfiction and sci-fi and everything comedy. And it's all fun, and we laugh when we create all of it. Like, even the most dark, dire stuff is like, oh, this is so fun. So there's nothing that's a true, (laughs) quote, sellout for us. Awesome. Excellent. Well, I think we're about to head off to a break soon. So I've got some more questions that uh, we actually did a whole thing on social media. So people sent in some questions to ask about self-publishing and about you guys. So we'll be coming back from the break, and we'll be heading into some of those questions with you guys. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back real soon. What if business could be fun? What if business is the adventure of living? What are you choosing? Where do you do business that makes it easier, more fun, or more joyful for you? We'd love to see where you do business. Connect with us on Instagram at Joy of Business or Twitter at Joy of Business. And share your pictures with hashtags Business Done Where and Joy of Business. Let's change the world with business. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah. In the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. The number one reason girls drop out of school in sub Saharan Africa is lack of access to feminine hygiene products. The Pads for School Girls Project, an outreach of Humanity Healing International, is changing this paradigm by setting up sewing programs at schools, teaching girls a vocational skill, while producing the reusable pads that help keep them attending classes. The girls pay it forward by making and giving pad kits to other girls in need. To learn more, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. 
the cutting edge of conscious radio, Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Hey everybody, welcome back. You're with Simone Millicis on Joy of Business. Now, guys, I haven't even really explained to you about Joy of Business, but it's like, you know, I wrote, I actually wrote a book <laughs> called Joy of Business using these access consciousness tools that um, I met Gary Douglas, the founder of Access, about 14 years ago, and he was just talking about everything that I sort of wanted to create on the planet. And I was like, oh yeah, this is this is what the planet should be like. This is what people should be like with each other. It should be fun. And one of the things that I've always got is every single job I've ever done, every business I've ever had, I did it for the fun of it. I didn't do it to make money, and I did it for the fun of it, and money seemed to show up. And I thought, insanely, that that's what everybody chose. So when I realized that people did jobs and they hated them and they complained on Mondays, you know, about going to work and Wednesday, it's that dreary halfway through the week, you know, especially in Australia on a Friday afternoon, it's like, cool, let's go for beers and you know, drink ourselves stupid because now we've got the weekend and then you complain about going back on Monday. That never made sense to me. I was like, why aren't you doing something you love? This is insane. This is your life. And it's like, so start doing something you love. So I actually wrote a book called Joy of Business. And I've got it translated now into six different languages as well. So I hear you when you guys say that it's not about making, well, it's it's pretty hard to make money on a book. And it's like I've spent a small fortune on the translation but what I do get is I followed up with things like classes and stuff. So I get people, you know, from Germany and Poland and Croatia, et cetera, that are, are so grateful and so enthused and so excited that they're not wrong for actually loving business. Because what I've noticed is this reality tends to project at you that you're supposed to hate your job. You're supposed to hate what you do. You're not supposed to love what you do. It's an unusual sort of uh, thing. So... I know Rebecca Holst, who works with us, found you guys on your podcast and was like, hey, these guys have so much fun doing what they do. <laughs> Let's meet them. Let's interview them and see, see what's up. <laughs> so, and so one of the things that um, I wanted to ask you guys, too, is about sort of working as a team. And it's like, I mean, when you, so Johnny lives in, no, you live in Austin, Sean. Yes, I live in Austin. All right. Johnny, where do you live? Well, I'm I'm in Ohio near Cleveland, but I'm moving to Austin within the next few months. Oh, okay. And then Dave, he lives somewhere different too. He lives redacted. in Redacted. In where? <laughs> he lives in Florida, but he he doesn't say where in Florida. It's oh, it's, a, it's a national secret. <laughs> yeah, he's paranoid. So national secret, uh huh. Somewhere in Florida, God's waiting, ta- God's waiting country. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always feel I always feel really old and tired when I go to Florida, and I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, that's right. It's surrounded by people who are living here who have retired. That's why I feel like I need to go and nap in the afternoon. So anyway, um, so what I wanted to talk to you about, because the thing is, we're a really global company as well, and it's like, I mean, we've got people all over the world, so we hardly ever actually see each other physically. But we're always, you know, on Skype or talking or whatever, and we're working together as this sort of creative team around the world. Like our team is in Italy and New Zealand and Australia and the U.S., and then we've got scattered people all over the place. So it's like, how do you guys see working together, not living in the same area, like as the creative process? And it's like, what sort of tools do you use? What, how do you, how do you make that fun? And easy? Uh, well, we. We use um, Slack all the time. <laughs> Slack. I mean, we'll Slack each other at the most inopportune times. Um, we we use Skype. We use email. Uh, we use Google Hangouts. Um, but really, it's just about fluid communication. You know, we. I don't think there's even on the weekends we're talking. Um, we use phone. Um, we just make sure that we're always in constant communication and kind of talking about the things that. Um, we are doing the things that we're excited about doing soon. Um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of keeping one another um, engaged and excited and also being there to vent. So there are things that we hate <laughs> about our job and, you know, we make it safe for each other to complain about those things um, <laughs> because, you know, we, 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 you need to be there for that too. Um, you know, most things that we do are, are, are pretty awesome. We're pretty excited to, to do, you know, 90% of it. But the 10% that sucks, it, it's also important to acknowledge that it sucks because um, otherwise you, you kind of have to keep that inside and that's not fun. Yeah, so Sean who does is, all the um, financial sort of side of things? 
I'm sorry. Who does the, <laughs> oh. I think that's funny. Who does all the financial sort of side of things, like all your bookkeeping and finances and the accounting? We just that's hired a guy, actually. I see. Well, nice. Yeah, very, very appropriately. We actually, um, what's interesting about our team, we have nine of us now at our publishing company is Sterling and Stone, and there's nine people now. And it's so it's the three of us: it's me, Sean, and Dave. But then we have um, our studio manager, who is like our project coordinator, like she keeps everybody on track. Um, we have somebody who's admin. We have a copywriter. Um, we have a podcast producer. We have um, a, a whatever, like he's video production and and whatever. And and um, and then the last person. Is, um, He's our, our viral I, engineer. <laughs> whatever that means. And then the last guy is our controller, like accountant, bookkeeper. But what I was going to say is every single one of those people came to us not because we, like, reached out and, and put an ad somewhere for, like, we need this position or we knew them from another life. It was because they, like, they were orbiting in our sphere of the podcast. Like, the guy who, mm. who does our finances um, – actually came to us and he kind of wanted to write with us. He was very inspired. He had a traditional banking job, but he wanted to be a writer. Like he had an alter ego and he wanted to be a writer. And so he ended up being our <clears throat> our financial guy. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that the lines, like what you just said about enjoying your work and it being very strange to think that people don't, like we can so relate to that. And our company feels that way too. It feels like a group of friends hanging out doing fun stuff a lot more than it feels like, you know, let's sit down and do the business, even though, of course, we do need to draw those lines and get stuff done. So even the financial stuff is being handled by a fan of of Sterling and Stone and of our podcast. So it's just kind of a weird – everything is fun, I guess, is what I'm saying. No, that's really cool, and I like that because it's like that's how we are too. I mean, I have – spoken you know over the years numerous times to people that i've worked with and i'm like hey if this is not fun for you and it's like it has to be a choice every day it's like if it's not fun for you then i'm so grateful for everything that we've been i mean it's a little bit like i marriage never made sense to me because i was like how can you look at someone for and say for the next 50 years that you still you want to be with them for the next 50 years it's like i don't know what i want to be doing in 50 years time so it never really made sense to me even though i'm in an awesome relationship and it's like, but the same thing with working, it's like, and people always do this, like I read this article yesterday and they were like, you know, devastation, these two people break up over 18 years. And I'm like, why do they do that? Why don't they go, hey, these two people spent 18 years together. That's pretty damn cool. <laughs> you know, how does it get any better than that? Have a glass of champagne, thank each other, be grateful and move on. And it's like, that's what I think work should be too. And it's like, you know, if you decide to leave or change something, it should just be like, thank you so much for the time that we've spent together. And let's move on because it should be a choice every moment. So that's where I come from. So I love the way you guys are uh, creating this and doing that. So can I ask also, Sterling and Stone, this is about you guys. I'm just, I've am just i been looking at your website and stuff. And uh, do, you, do you actually publish for other people or this is just about you guys writing and publishing your stuff? Um, it's just us right now. Um, I'm sure we'll have authors um, that we publish in the future. But right now, it's just um, – it's a very small group of people um, that we – you know, we've got a few different imprints. We have Realm and Sands. The, the, the two main imprints are Realm and Sands, which is me and Johnny, and then Collect Inkwell, which is me and Dave. Right. So you've got sterlingandstone.net is the website. Is there anywhere else that people can find you to – because you've got a whole lot of tools and stuff that, you know, blogs and everything that people can check out of how to actually publish their own book as well, right? Uh, yeah, but um, th- that's a smaller part of our business. We we really do try to focus on on fiction and storytelling. Um, one of our imprints is the Smarter Artist, and that's where we we talk to you know creative entrepreneurs who who kind of want to alchemize their creativity um, into an actual business. And that's you know th- that's the the fiction and box project that we did. That's our self publishing podcast. Um, that's you know largely our our podcast network where we have nine different shows right now, um, and they all are running off of um, Sterling and Stone. Uh, but but our, our primary business is, is telling stories. You know, we, we write books. Cool. So where do people, where can people find all of them? Like where do they, we want to sell lots of books to them. <laughs> all the listeners, where can they check you out? Where's the best place to find what you guys have done? Um, you can find Sterling. 
Well, Go I was going to wonder what your answer was. I was going to say that it, it should be Sterling and Stone.net, but we're in the midst of a website transition right now. So it, it kind of isn't. Um, booksellers like, you know, Amazon and, and iBooks and, and Kobo and those sorts of places are where, um, are where we are. Um, our, our nonfiction book, it, it, like our big one that actually Sean didn't mention when he was listing the smarter artist things is write, publish, repeat. And um, that's that's sort of our seminal work on self-publishing. Like that's that's the thing that usually people um, find us for when they're coming at us from that nonfiction angle of like how do you how do you get how do you start a business like this? And and honestly, the formula is right in the title of that book: write, publish, then repeat. Because I think that's when I was we sort of put a couple posts up on social media and asked people, well, what would you guys want to know about self-publishing? And I think that when I'm listening to you guys talk too, it's really cool because there's so many similarities between like Simone and Joy Business and how you guys create as well. And I get there's so many people out there who are like, okay, I have a book. And a lot of the questions I saw was how did you start? You guys have quite a following now, right, And with series. And, like, how do you suggest to someone to start out to start creating that? And I get we're going to be going to break soon, so we might have to get into it more. But, like, how do you start off creating that? We've, we've got about one minute. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I can answer that in one minute. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, you, All right, you so need you a, got a joke in the next minute, and then we can do it in the next Yeah, break. there we go. Uh, <laughs> how, how, about I, how about I do a teaser, like a cliffhanger? It's the, okay, um, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, you, you need to not do what we did. Is that enough, or do I need, like, another 30 seconds, and then I can explain Ooh, it after yeah. the Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. You need to okay. not do what you guys did, and it's like, ooh, what's that? Now we've got what the audience the just sitting on the yeah. brink of their chair going, must wait, can't go out now. <laughs> <laughs> must wait to the next section. So... So you're, if you want to check this out, you can go to uh, what's it called sterlingandstone.net and check out these guys. And it's like they've got like Google Hangouts, et cetera, you can find as well. And we will be back very, very soon. We've got like five seconds, ten seconds. And this show is on self-publishing. So if you've ever wanted to write and it's like get to work, write, and it's like and then we're going to tell you about more about the next steps really soon. We'll be joining you by coming back really soon. Have you ever wondered how to change your love paradigm? The secret key is finding a love partnership, not just a regular connection. How do you find these? Through conscious relationships. Ascending Hearts Dating is a dating site for people like you that believes in second chances and a different type of spiritual connection. Try Ascending Hearts for free today at AscendingHearts.com and change your love paradigm. Ascending Hearts, the premier dating community for the spiritually awake. Conscious Parenting Radio Show provides inspiration and resources for loving, empowering, and respecting your children and yourself. Join me, Timothy, every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time as we consciously explore proven ways of living together in happiness, health, and harmony. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Would your business and life like to be bigger? Would you like to have more fun with everything you do? Simone Millicis travels the world facilitating joy of business seminars. These classes are for you if you would like to create more money and joy, expand your business, and work smarter, not harder. Join her live or watch the online seminar from the comfort of your own home. Go to www.accessjoyofbusiness.com to register and for more information. Connecting you with the best of the conscious minds in the world. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Okay, so we're back. It's Simone Millicent on the Joy Business Radio Station. And as Johnny just wrote in our little Skype thread here, this was a solid cliffhanger. I love that wording. <laughs> it's like so. Emily, take it away with your questions and with uh, where we left it there. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's so great because you guys have such a cool audience. And I know you've done series and you've done nonfiction. And so I'm curious for the people out there, 
and like you said, the title of your book, Write, Publish, and Then Repeat. So what are people, after they get their first book out there, what are the next steps that you've seen create a lot for you guys and your business and creating a following? Um, All right. Well, really. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead you, you go. No, please, please. Go well, ahead. I was going to address my. I was going to address my cliffhanger, but it's not precisely an answer to the question. Should I? Should I go that route? No, address the okay. cliffhanger. Do the cliffhanger. Yeah. Okay. Do the cliffhanger. So, um, yeah. So I said, I said, don't do what we do. And actually, um, halfway through, I think the existing episodes of the self-publishing podcast. And I think we have like 180 now. Um, we changed the intro, and because we wanted to slip in the line, basically something about this isn't advice. Uh, which I'm realizing isn't in the intro anymore. But we say that all the time because we, we, we're kind of giving self-publishing advice, but we're, we're also careful to say, look, this is what we're doing, and you need to distill out the why that we're doing this rather than just blindly copying. So here's where I was going with that, is um, the first book that Sean and I wrote together was a fantasy Western mashup called Unicorn Western. The second book that we wrote was a serious, high-minded sci-fi political thriller called The Bean. And then I think in short order we did a, another philosophical sci-fi piece, a horror book, and then three irreverent comedies. And so <clears throat> if you're noticing, that's like kind of all over the place, like in an extreme way. And that's because we made a conscious decision to go broad first and establish ourselves as storytellers rather than we are writers in a genre. And so here's mm -hmm. the part where I say don't do what we did. I thought um, that's clever. That, well, <laughs> yeah. so did we. <laughs> like, He's no, the cliffhanger, not. though. <laughs> right. It's it's not lucrative. Um, we did uh, well enough to be self-published, like, full-time writers that year, but mm, barely. And so what is much more logical for somebody starting out is just is to stick to a genre and to write a series. And that's actually what Sean and Dave did they, is in Collective Inkwell in that imprint is they, they did stick to a genre. Collective Inkwell does, um, you know, kind of horror and dark sci-fi, and they had their sort of keystone series was Yesterday's Gone, and they, they just kept stacking Yesterday's Gone. And doing that is much more sensible than what we did, but, but our ends and our intentions were a little different. We wanted to make sure that we didn't get stuck in one genre, so we said, okay, well, we'll profit later, which is what we're doing now, and we'll forego that so that we can build wide. Right, because it's really easy to get pigeonholed, and then you just become, you know, the horror guy or the sci-fi guy or gal. And, um, you know, we figured it, we're definitely taking the long way around. We're absolutely making less money than if we just took one genre and hammered it over and over and over. But long term, we believe we're making the right decision. We're not only having more fun, um, you know, with every project because we're not getting tired. We're not getting burned out. You know, we know some genre authors who are making – substantial money, but they also feel trapped by what they're they're writing and, and they're not able to branch out even though they desperately want to. And so we're you know, we're excited by everything that we write where there's nothing there's too much awesome. You know, we, we're not able to fit it into our schedule. There's always more that we want to write and um so we're we're really excited about everything that we're doing and it it'll take longer but you know we're we're trying to accomplish two things. Uh, we want to really build an audience of readers who love everything that we're doing and are willing to follow us no matter where we go. And, um, you know, ultimately we want to be known as storytellers, not as a specific kind of storytellers, but as, as guys who could really do anything. Cool. You know, and I but listen join... to that too, Simone, I think like at Joy of Business we talk a lot about looking at not short-term profit, but at the possibilities long-term. And it's really cool because it seems like that's where you guys are functioning from. Like, yeah, this isn't going to make a lot of money at first, but you knew, like, kind of what else was possible looking towards the future. That That's very true. And the other one is um, sort of something that Sean already mentioned is the choice to do more fiction, not nonfiction. Because he, Sean and I both come out of kind of the, the, the marketing world. Like, we understand copywriting. We understand a lot of this um, – you know, we know how to sell stuff. And so it would be very, very easy to turn on the, the nonprofit teach self, teach, teach self publishing money making machine, which um, plenty of people do. And mm -hmm. we've, we keep turning away from that. And it's, it's just like, it's not, it's not that we're too good for it. It's not that we think it's wrong, but it would be very easy to kind of declare to the world that that's what we're doing and, and center our profits there. 
And so actually one of our 2015 goals uh, was, a, it was, quote, a total eclipse of fiction over nonfiction for this reason. We want to be a profit, a business that's, that, that's profit is driven by fiction, by our art, not by talking about the art. And so we've made a really specific focus on that. But it's not always easy because it's like, oh, there's so much easy money over in that direction. But no, 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 avoid the temptation, you know. So you pretty much make what you guys do, like the fun of it and the joy of it, your priority. Like what Emily was saying before, too, it's like one of the things that we talk about is maximizing possibilities, not profits. Because most of the time I find, too, if you're actually doing what you love and it's like you are you know, creating what brings you joy each day. And it's like, then the money ends up showing up. And it's like, I know that that's a really random sort of quote to say, but it's like, that's what I've noticed has happened in my life. Every time I do something for money, it's like this ends up being this really um, sort of weird energy about it. Whereas when you're doing something because you actually love doing it and you want to create something, like whether it's your, you know, artistic abilities or whatever that is, and it's like, the money shows up. It's like you're not making the profit about the most important thing. So how does it get any better than that? Well, it does. That's one of the tools that we've got in access. He's asking the question of how does it get any better than this? Because every time you ask a question and it's like there's more stuff that shows up and it's like, all right, so what else is possible now? And it's like you've created this business, you've got this, and it's like, you know, now what else can you add to it? So, you know, so we've got some questions here from our, as we did, we told you, we put it out there into our social media circle and some people wrote in some questions that they wanted answered. So, uh, let me start with this one. So someone's written, I've already written a book. I don't want it to sound and look like a poor quality self-published book, which I think means working with an edited designer. I know how much they cost and it's more than I can invest right now. Are there any other options? How many different ways are there to create a self-published book that doesn't scream self-published? Well, you can iterate on that. I mean, you can upload it now and then um, make a few sales and then get a better a cover a better edit. Um, you can't go <laughs> right. You, you can't go totally sloppy though, because it just won't serve you. Um, if you put something really sloppy out there, uh, if you have a, a cover that clearly looks self-published, um, you know, and those covers stand out, you know, uh, and you won't get a lot of sales. It's a few years ago. It was a little bit easier because there weren't so many self-published books out there. And it, you know, it just wasn't as hard. But but now there are so many self-published books, and you know, a lot of them aren't quite as good. And so, um, you know, the, the buyers are just more aware. And you have to you have to look the part. You have to look professional. And if your book cover looks self-published, then it's going to be um, a lot of the books that have really amateur-looking covers also don't have professional edits. And so. Um, readers have gotten those books they felt burned and so that's one of the things that they look out for so at the very least you want to get a professional cover um, you really need a professional edit and if you can't get those things at the bare minimum then maybe it's okay just to hold off on publishing a little bit until you can get the basics um, you can go to elands there are places that you can go to get not spend a fortune on an edit or a cover but your reader deserves at least that at a minimum, you know, a proofread book that is not riddled with typos. That's yeah, what I was going to ask. Besides, yeah. Oh, sorry, Simone. Like, besides yeah, Elance, right. like, where else would you recommend people to go, like, for that? Like, for what you're saying, well, get yourself a good cover, a decent something. Where do you guys, like, what resources do you recommend or do you use? <laughs> I, I just feel the need. Um, <clears throat> normally, this is the point where we get into our awkward ad read on our podcast. Um, yeah, our sponsor is 99designs, and that's sort of our first stop recommendation just um, because they're awesome. But we also work with uh, freelance designers, too. And um, the, the people that we work with, we just kind of – I don't even know, like, how we end up finding them. So, But I know that the traditional advice is you find a book that you um, that you like the cover that seems pro and um, find out who did it and, and, and ask them. But the thing about a pro cover – is um, and I don't mean to make it all about the cover, but I would say that the cover is ninety 
Well, it's your first impression, let's say that. Um, you can come off as, as unprofessional and self-published really, really easily if you um, don't have good editing, if your, your story doesn't make sense, if you, your description is bad, but cover is like this, this big thing. And it has to be genre appropriate too, and it's a case where good enough kind of isn't. Um, for a long time we said, well, it's 80-20, we'll just get 80% of it, and um, Dave did our covers for a while. He's, a, he's a, an artist, and but he's not a book cover designer, and so we kind of said, well, Dave can do them, that, that's good enough. And it just it just isn't like it just isn't. You see, you need a book cover designer. Um, another one that's really good is Demanza. Um, I don't think we've ever used them per- personally, but we've seen great results. D e m o n z a. dot com is that right, Sean? That's correct. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that would be those would be my recommendations. You know what? You guys are making me want to get a new book cover. And we we've actually um, our company has a publishing company now too. We ended up creating one because every publishing company we had. Um, deals with was just became annoying to <laughs> to to put it simply. So uh, we ended up creating our own publishing company, and we use Ninety Nine Designs all the time. But you, uh, I actually got a friend of mine to design my cover. So, and I've been thinking about it recently, and I think that's why I'm going to head. I'm going to do second edition, Joy Business, and see what I can find on Ninety Nine Designs. Because you're correct. I think the cover, like even though you said not making it all about the cover. I travel all around the world, and I'm at airports all the time. And when you're, you know, pulling your carry-on along and you're walking past one of those news link stands or whatever, and it's like the books that stand out are the ones that you want to stop and have a look at. And it's like whether it's the name or the picture or the author's photo on there or whatever that is, I think it's actually, you know, incredibly important to have that professionalism about it. And it doesn't have to cost that much. And it's like like getting that professional edit and also getting – um, more than one person to proof it is what I've um, even professional proofers and it's like when once they've done it there's always another typo someone always finds a typo <laughs> is what I always find so we're about to go off to another break and we'll be into our last session so we'll be back really soon and joined by Johnny and Sean and Emily and Samori Have you bought into the idea that you have to work hard for your money, that business is hard? I will share some dynamic access consciousness tools to get you out of your own way so you can create a business that actually succeeds. Join me, Simone Millicis, on the Joy of Business at 4 p.m. Mondays Eastern. As difficult as it is to believe, there are places in Africa where human traffickers sell albino children and their body parts for use in magic rituals. Humanity Healing International is actively working in Uganda to change this paradigm. The Albino Rescue Project finds albino children who are at risk and places them in safe schools and environments where they can learn and grow free from fear. To learn more or to sponsor a child, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Are you trying to get from point A to point B and need a little advice? Connect with the counselors at Ohm Times Advisors. Whether you're looking for a life coach or a spiritual intuitive, the advisors participating at advisors.omtimes.com were carefully chosen based on their gifts, skills, and professionalism. Ohm Times Advisors, connecting you with the best advisors in the business. Hi, I'm Katrina Kavanagh, host of the I Am Wisdom radio show. I Am Wisdom is about the connection between mind work and energy work, spirituality, and living a wonderful life. Looking forward to sharing each Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with you. Your conscious connection to a more mindful world. Om Times Radio. I Om FM. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. You're with Simone Millicent on Joy Business with Emily Russell, our amazing social media and beyond that expert. And we've got... um, Sean and Johnny joining us, and we're talking about self-publishing. These guys have written a whole lot of different books in different genres, and they're giving us some tools today on, you know, how to go about that, etc. I think Emily, you had a couple of questions. 
Yeah, I was just wanted to ask you guys a little bit more about your creative process because you guys work together, um, and you probably do things a little differently. And one of one of the things we talk about, like enjoy business and excess consciousness, is this idea that a lot of the things we make ourselves wrong for, whether it's like something with our creative process or how we do business, actually, when we look at it differently, can really be we can use it to our advantage or we see how it's actually a gift. And I was wondering if there's something like that that you guys have seen with this whole process of self-publishing or just to talk more about your creative process and how your uniqueness, like, works for you guys. Oh, yeah. We don't really believe in, you know, mistakes at all. Um, if there are times that we fall in, it's just because we figure out a better way later. We're, we're very iterative. Um, we, you know, ready, fire, aim. We, we figure we get it out there and we um, improve on, on not just everything, you know, our craft, but also our systems and, and all of that. So we don't really think that there's a, a right or a wrong. There's definitely things that work better for us. And within different parts of the company, uh, for example, you know, I, I work very differently with Dave than I work with Johnny. Um, but, you know, as far as the, the two of us go, um, it, it's really just about leaning into one another's strengths. So there's things that, you know, I, you know what, honestly, I, I don't know that there's anything that one of us is, is really better at. It, it's, it's more of a matter of preference. There are things that we prefer to do in the partnership, and so that's what we do. Johnny loves writing rough drafts, and I really love outlining. And because that's where our natural interests lay, um, you know, it, it's it's very easy to just say, okay, well, I'll take the outlining, and Johnny says, I'll take the rough draft, and then, um, you know, we, we, we go from there. Uh, so it, I think it's a matter of when you're when you have a creative partner, it's really important to, you know, take the temperature and, um, just really listen. Um, it's like any relationship, um, you know, uh, n not that Johnny's my wife, <laughs> but it's the same thing you know, with my <laughs> wife where, you know, we definitely, there are things that, that she excels at in the relationship and there are things that I excel at in the relationship. And, you know, we, we do our part and it's not 50, 50, it's a hundred, a hundred, you know, Johnny and I both pour a hundred percent of everything that we have into all that we do. And I think it's really evident when you read our stories that, you know, we're putting a lot of ourselves and, and we're answering questions about the world through the fiction that we create and the way we bond with our audience and the way that we're, you know, really willing to experiment on anything. Um, there's a lot of trust in the relationship, and I think that helps us, you know, go better faster. What do you mean you're answering questions about the world? Um, well, we write what we call uh, Realm and Sands. Uh, we refer to it as inquisitive fiction, uh, which is mm -hmm. something that, that Johnny made up, which I just think so perfectly describes what we do. Um, you know, our we we may have gonzo ideas, you know, like uh, you know a, a western featuring a unicorn, or you know Downton Abbey with robots. Our, our book, Robot Proletariat, um, or, you know these strange, quirky things, but but they always hide um, larger questions that we're we're trying to ask ourselves. So Downton Abbey with robots really has a lot of um, very deep questions about the nature of consciousness. Um, our, our book, Axis of Aaron, that um, that Johnny was talking about earlier, is really about you know loss and letting go and the nature of memory. And so we we. We know ourselves very well because we spend so much time getting to know ourselves. Um, that's kind mm. of what write, writing is. It's looking in the mirror. And so, you know, we're, we're not writing any, you know, high-minded nonfiction treaties. We're, we're writing fiction stories, but, um, but we're using those fictional stories to um, kind of answer questions for ourselves, you know, about life and love and loss and death and um, all the bigger questions that we would ask ourselves anyway. That's great. I love that. Yeah, I know, because there's so many more. I mean, if you look out there now, it's like all the movies and, um, you know, all the books, everything out there now, it's like they are starting to sort of access that place of the questions that people do have. Because I know I've walked around for years and years going, this can't be it. I mean, we have an amazing planet, and it's like this is just incredible. And the the way the earth is, the way the plants are, the way the animals are, the way the ocean is, I mean, I live across the road from the beach, and it's incredible, and it's like – there's got to be something more than what the humans treading upon this earth are, are creating. So, so I like that, that you're actually addressing those questions because it's like it is coming out. I mean, look at Avatar. It's like when the Avatar came out, everyone just sort of breathed a sigh of relief and went, oh, yeah, something about this matches the energy of what I know should exist or could exist or did exist. So 
I love that. So what's one of your favorite books that you guys have written? Um, well, Do you have a favorite? My, my favorite, favorite child? Is, yeah, yeah, well, it actually, people say, well, it's impossible to pick their favorite. Um, I do have a favorite, and it's the book that has now been mentioned twice, Axis of Aaron. It's our least selling title, kind of by far, <laughs> well, maybe not by far, but it, it, it's because it's literary and it's big and um, it is a mind bender, it, it doesn't sell that well. But that's that's probably my personal favorite, but as far as something a little more commercial, um, I'm I can probably I'm gonna steal Sean because he's probably gonna say the Beam, which is our sci fi serial, which is mm-hmm. um it's it's um I don't know how to describe it because it is it is sci fi but it's it's about the intersection of um technology with where humanity is is going. And one of the things we hear a lot is um this feels so inevitable. Like, you know, I just I just walk down the street and I see people, you know, um texting on their phones and they're connected to the network, blah, blah, blah. And I can just imagine like the world of the beam is going to feel very real coming forward. Um, so those are, I've, those would be my two favorites. I'm, I'm choosing a second one because the first one felt like a cop out since we've already discussed it. <laughs> um, what um, do you mean by I, the I first like... one being a mind bender though? I'd like to know more about that. Um, it's, you know, I don't, I don't know if you've seen Mulholland Drive or Vanilla Sky. Um, those movies. I have actually, are... yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, so, so, like that, in the way that those are kind of mind benders, and you, you know, you don't really know which, which end is up. That sort of. Right. Thing. Okay. Cool. And your, um, John. Um. Well, I love both of those. It's hard to disagree with that. Um, but I'll go with. Um, I, I'll pick another two. I'll pick uh, Unicorn Western because I think for what it is, it, it starts with such a silly premise, and um, I think it, it becomes something truly epic by the end. And it was the first thing that we ever did together, so I'll always have a lot of affection for that book. Um, I, I think it's I think it's it's truly truly special, um, and I like Invasion um, just because it's really awesome um, how much love the book's gotten, and it's it's really gratifying to read something. Um, that so many people have read. How long have you guys actually been working together for? Um, I uh, think three years. All right. The podcast is about three and a half years old, and I actually came out of the podcast as supposedly the everyman. So Sean and Dave were pumping out, quote, a book a week, and they were episodes of the serial, but it was still a release every week, and they were, you know, 20,000 words, something like that. And so I was like, I can't, I don't understand that. So I came onto the show as um, the guy who wouldn't understand that. I was like, I have one book. Right. I, I couldn't write with another writer. I couldn't write, I couldn't produce that fast. And so um, this is my long-winded way of saying that the podcast preceded Sean and I working together by maybe six months. And that's all it took for us to realize we already knew each other. We already knew we liked each other, but it it was a new level of vibing. Like, oh, we can do that too. And um, Sean and Dave have about a year and a half on Sean and I as far as working together. So, I mean, the one thing I have noticed from talking to you guys is the uh, gratitude that you both have for each other and for Dave. And it's like that you do get on so well. Do you think that that's unusual or is it something that you have to work on or it's something that created or something that was just like, oh, my God, I found I found the one. <laughs> that well, I so this is funny. Yeah, this is funny because Sean already made the analogy of he said, "Well, Johnny's not really my wife, ha ha ha." But um, my wife but and you I are. don't. <laughs> in a way, yeah, he's he's kind of my work wife. Yeah. My wife and I don't we don't we don't fight. Like supposedly that's a normal thing, but we just don't. I I don't know what that means. Um, but Sean and I, I because I, I was thinking about this a while ago, and it, it extends to Dave too. Sean works more directly with Dave than I work directly with Dave, but we don't really have. Uh, there's not much contention. There, there haven't been. There have been times when we've disagreed, but there haven't been arguments. Um, I and I am grateful for for both of these guys and for all of our audience. And it does feel a little kismet. Like it does feel a little bit like, wow, we really work together well. The three of us. There are very specific roles that we fill. And I, I do think it wasn't difficult for me because it's not like I tried this a bunch of times. But I can imagine how difficult it would be to find a partner or collaborator who you don't just work well with, but you 
I don't know, you get along with your idealistically the same. So only right now are we formalizing the agreements that we've been operating under for nearly five years in the longest version here. Uh, everything right. was on a handshake. You know, Sean got all the money. Like, officially, it was all his. And then, you know, he, he paid us our, our share, and we just never worried about it. So there's a, a lot of trust that we've always had, and I've just, I guess, taken it for granted. Yeah, I think the big thing is um, when you're in a collaborative relationship like that, um, the most important thing is to not bring a lot of ego. Um, now, now, you can have ego as far as um, I know I'm awesome and I do awesome things um, because, you know, you have to have that. That's That's how you create something cool. But you can't use your ego um, in a competitive way. I, I think that's the thing. None of us, none of the three of us, are competitive with one another. Um, you know, we all we all want to be a team. We all want to um, prop each other up, and I think that that's really important. It's not about um, no one's counting ideas. No, I love it. It's it feels really nice, and to me, and it's like when you talk about you know answering questions about the world, etc. It's like to me that's the energy of how you should be creating business. It's the way you should be creating your life. I mean, I'm the same thing. It's like I've never fought with my partner in my life, and my mother told me that that was unusual. <laughs> that was odd. We were weird, and I'm like, why? Why should you fight? So it's like I think what you guys are doing is incredible, and I'm actually really grateful to have you on the show. And I just one last time want to find uh, if you guys want to give out anything of where people can find you or where you want people to hook into your podcast or anything like that. Now is the time. Uh, probably the most logical thing for this audience is our self-publishing podcast. It's every week. Um, and you can find everything that we do at sterlingandstone.net. But as far as that podcast, um, search iTunes, search our directory, any directory that you want, that sort of thing. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show, and we'll see you next time on Off Time Radio.